so preparing for the build um let's go into that in this chapter the host tools needed for building lfs are checked and if necessary installed and then the partition for the host is prepared and we'll create the partition itself create a file system on it and mount it so we need the host system now normally i'd say download um a version of linux and install it and use that or use the current one that you're you've got installed um but in this case we're doing it in a virtual environment so we we definitely do need to install one i do have two recommendations for uh, linux to use as a host my primary one is gen 2 they're now once again producing regularly a live usb image um, they, they hadn't produced one for several years the last one i think they produced was 2016 and they hadn't produced one up until sometime last year i think and now they're producing it every week or so i believe it's been i think it's every week so this this would be my primary uh, recommendation for a host distribution why it's not because really because i use gen 2 as my um day-to-day -day, um linux distribution it's because gen 2 is a compiled distribution and we are compiling a new distribution so by extension it's naturally lends itself to compiling and certainly if you use gen 2 you'll have all the tools you need to get on with compiling uh, most other distributions uh, i'd say at least 95 percent, if not more 98 percent, maybe don't come with the default development tools and you have to go around looking for uh, the packages that need to be um, installed to give you a full development environment to allow you to compile Linux from scratch. Um, there's another Linux environment or Linux distribution I recommend as a second secondary one. Um, it's not a compiled one, but it does come with all the tools, and that's Endeavor OS. Um, and that's a smaller image as well. It seems to always fit on a 2 gig image, which is quite handy for me because I've got an old 2 gig USB stick, which wouldn't be used for anything else. Um, and their USB image always fits on that, so that's quite convenient. Um, and as I say, it, it by default comes with the tools needed to um, do some compiling for Linux from scratch. So that's my second recommendation. As I say, other Linux distributions, you invariably have to install um, other packages. Um, I've actually created some videos for what were at the time the top 10 top most popular distributions according to distrowatch.com. Um, and each for each one of those videos I show a different distribution of what packages need need to be installed for Linux from scratch and how to install them so if you do decide you want to go with your own favorite for example favorite distribution um, and you're unsure then ho hopefully one of those videos will um, give you some hints otherwise if you for example you're on Mac or you're on Windows um, I'd recommend downloading the live GUI USB images, uh, USB image. So to get to this page, what I've done, if I go to the Gen2 homepage, it's www.gen2.org, click on downloads, you'll come to this page here, and you can click on that link and you'll get the USB image. Um, you can also click down here, if I open this in a new tab, it'll take you to a mirror that's near to you and the file you want to download is this one here where it starts live gui amd 64 uh, 2023 etc whatever the current date is so that one's dated the 26th of february which is a matter of days ago um an advantage come here also is that you can download the um signature file for that download so you can actually verify that the download is uh, all present and correct um, if I show you I've already downloaded one um, a while back this is dated the 20th so it's a 
just over a week old. Um, you can see that I've downloaded the checksum files. So once you've downloaded those two files, it's a simple case of running, well, on Linux, um, if you're on Windows or Mac OS, it'll be some other command. Uh, but if you do minus SHA-256 sum, minus C, and the name of that file there, and just wait for that to process it and you can see it's come up saying that the file that we're checking is okay so i know that that, that file has been downloaded successfully and it's not been corrupted or tampered with uh, you can ignore this other message here so that's the host system we're going to be using uh, within the virtual environment i guess the next thing we need to do is to um download the virtual machine and the one I've chosen one I've used before is virtualbox.org I'm aware there's other virtual environments you can use um, you're quite welcome to use them I can't comment on how successful the build would be but I can't imagine there'd be much difference um, having not used any others but I can certainly recommend VirtualBox. I've used it previously and it's uh, quite reliable and quite nice to use, quite easy to use. Uh, you can see just download the latest version which is 7.6 released uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago. Get that installed and when you run it you'll end up with a window like this. So what we're going to do now is to set up the virtual environment uh, which invol involves defining the virtual machine and creating a disk that we can store the um, virtual uh, or the, the new Linux from scratch on that we're going to be building. So what we need to do here is to click this new button and give the machine a name. So this is just an arbitrary name. So I'm going to call it LFS 11.3 because that's what I'm going to be building on it. Um, the next part is a place where all the machine files are going to be stored. So you can accept the default for that unless you particularly want to put it somewhere else. ISO image, it wants an ISO image to boot from because it's a brand new machine. It needs an operating system to run from. And we just need to specify the ISO image that we've downloaded from Gen 2. So if we click that, click other. and go to home I've saved mine in ISOs there's the ISO there that I've downloaded I've already done the checksum on it uh, by the way if you're in KDE you can also do properties uh, go to checksums and if you run the calculate against against the SHA-256 uh, I've done this in the wrong order let's open this here which open on that window if I copy the actual SHA signature there so that's in the clipboard if I now do properties checksum if I paste that checksum in there and do calculate not only would it do the checksum and calculate it this I think I believe it goes green if it matches so it's just to show that if you're using KDE there's another way of calculating a bit more of a convenient way I guess yeah, you can see the background has gone green there. It's also printed it up to show that it is identical. So that's quite a nice convenience. So yeah, I'm going to open this file here. It's selected down here. I'll open it and it's taken that. So now it needs to know what type of Linux it is. Um, we need to, well, we don't need to select this because it's identified the fact it's a Linux. Um, we can either leave this as Linux, you know, generic Linux, because although it's a Gen 2, it's going to eventually become uh, a Linux from scratch. But at the moment, it is actually a Gen 2 system. So if we scroll down, I believe somewhere there is a Gen 2. It's a 64-bit edition. So we can select that. You can see the little icon changes. I would have guessed that once we've built Linux from scratch, if you decide to boot Linux from scratch within this virtual environment again, you probably don't need to change this, but... If you do want to, um, my recommendation would be to put it onto this option here. Um, 
don't worry about this message saying that it can't determine the selected ISO. Um, everything will just work nicely when we come to getting in there. If we select next now, uh, we need to choose how much memory to give it. I'd recommend a minimum of four gigabytes, uh, preferably eight gigabytes um, as uh, a recommended working minimum. Uh, if you want to give it some more, then that's uh, up to you. Um, I'm going to go with uh, eight gig, which I'm sure should be plenty. Uh, actually, no, I won't. I'm going to give it a lot more. Um, I don't know why this has come up with 48 CPUs here. I've got a uh, 13th gen uh, Intel here, and it's uh, got 32 cores. So I would have expected that to be 32, not 48. But anyway, I'm going to knock this up to 24 to get the most out of the system. So generally, you want a minimum of one gigabyte per core. Um, some of the bigger packages in beyond Linux and Scratch may need as much as two gigabyte per core. So that's worth bearing in mind. So um, I'm, at the very least, I'm going to give this 48 gig um, because GCC may need it. Uh, sorry, not 48, 20, 24 gigabyte, which is, I can't remember how much 24 is, is it 24? Seven five six, I think, is it? No, I can't remember now. Um, let's calculate that. I thought it was two four five seven six, but let's twenty four times one oh two four. It is, so I'm not sure why it's got some weird number there. Six. Right, okay, so that's exactly 24 in terms of binary, 24 gigabytes. So yeah, like I say, uh, I'm pretty sure for the Linux from scratch, uh, roughly one gig per core is enough. Um, but if you're planning on doing beyond Linux from scratch, you want to consider about uh, up to two gigabytes per core for some of the bigger packages. Uh, I'm not going to be doing EFI. Again, it keeps things simpler. If you do select EFI in the book, it takes you off to BLFS. So it takes you away from the Linux from scratch book into the beyond Linux from scratch. Um, and there's several more packages to build. So again, the same as with the system V, keep it simple, uh, especially if it's your first time. Um, and we won't be doing the EFI in this instance. Create a virtual disk now. Um, it, it comes up with eight gigabytes as a recommendation. I would say that's an absolute minimum. I think you may even run out of space with eight gigabytes. Um, I would recommend that 10 gigabytes is the absolute minimum if you type for space. Um, nothing less than 10 uh, gigabytes to just, just to be on the safe side. But I'm pretty sure eight would be cutting it fine. I think you, you know if you used eight, more than likely would come across problems uh, in terms of uh, disk space. Uh, I'd say just to build Linux from scratch, a comfortable size would be something like 16 gigabytes. If you're thinking about beyond Linux from scratch, I'd say probably minimum 32 gig, depending on how much you want to install. And if you're going to go for as much as possible, I'd say 64 gigabytes of space. So. With the idea that I may be installing Beyond Linux from scratch, I haven't decided yet because uh, it's quite a lot of work involved. I'm going to knock this up to 32 gig. Uh, yeah, that's not snapping to any nice number, so I'll just put 32 there. Uh, Pre-allocate will allocate the disk space, uh, basically reserve it. Uh, I'm not going to do that because Linux and Scratch won't use 32 gig, as I say, it'll probably use you know, maybe 10 or 12 gigabytes. Use an existing option there. If you've got an existing disk file you want to use, um, don't don't select the, the last one. We definitely do need a, a hard disk. 
So I'll just click next there. Now we can check the summary. So just check the details that we've done. We've got 24 gig of memory, 24 processors, not using EFI, 32 gigabyte disk, and we're not pre-allocating it. So I'll just do finish now. And that's created the machine. So what we need to do now is to start the machine running. And this will boot the Gen 2 Live USB. So we just click on Start. You'll get this window coming up. And you can see that it started booting here. Um, what we need to do, first of all, is to make this full screen. So um, what we can do here, if I can remember, is to view full screen. We'll switch to full screen mode. Now, I believe if we press enter there it will stay as a little window I believe let's see how it goes sometimes when I do this it doesn't recognize that I've switched it full screen it doesn't use a full resolution um, and other times it does yeah it doesn't look like it has done in this case so what we need to do then if this happens to you is right click the desktop background Go to display settings and just select the native resolution of your screen. So I've set mine to um, HD, full HD. So this is what I'm going to set here. Apply that. It should take up the whole screen, which it has done now. So that's a bit better. I want to keep that. And that's okay. Now, what it had there before when it comes up by default is the keyboard setting. So I definitely want to change that because the default is a US keyboard and that will cause all sorts of problems when we're typing in commands and things. Likewise, if you're a non-US keyboard user, which I guess is everybody except for the US, um, you'll want to do this. Um, unfortunately, I can't recommend what are the best settings if you're not UK, but if you are UK, then I can show you what I set mine to. I set the keyboard model to generic 105 key PC, and that's probably the majority of keyboards out there, the standard Windows type keyboard. And if I apply that, go to layouts. If you click configure layouts, you'll get this option come. You can see the default US keyboard is there. If you just highlight it and remove it, and then click add. And then you can look down here for your keyboard. Um, you can either type in by the language, um, or what you can do is try by typing in the keyboard type. So for example, I want a UK keyboard um, by typing in bracket UK. And I want that one there, the extended Windows keyboard. You can click preview and it will show you a layout of the keyboard. And the peculiarity about the UK keyboards is that they've got this upside down L type return with the hash down here and the back tick up here and the backslash down here. So, um, and the tilde is on this button as well as a shift. So they're the important keys to look for for a UK keyboard. So that's the correct one for UK keyboard. Click OK. If I apply that now, um, that should be done. And somewhere I can test it. Yeah, here I can test it. So I'll press the hash button. That's fine. The tilde and the backslash and the back tick, which is not working. Let's try the shift. Yeah, that's that's fine. So that's all set up. Okay, you'll get messages coming up here from the um, VM from uh, sorry virtual box which you can click on here and it'll tell you stuff about them um, in this situation with Gen 2 yeah you can read them but you don't need to do any action it's captured the keyboard it's telling you that if you want to come out of uh, the keyboard as captured by virtual box you need to press the right control uh, button and one of the functions to get control back to the system and it tells me here that the host key is currently right control that, that can be configured same thing it says here about the fact that the virtual machine 
it does not support mouse integration. In fact, it does. I've just pushed the mouse off the screen onto my other screen where I'm recording from. Um, so it does. So what has happened is at the time this came up, it was when it was in the text mode, it couldn't capture the mouse. It didn't know about the mouse. But now that the graphical environment has booted, it has captured the mouse and you can see it's working fine. So that's not a problem. Down the bottom here, when you get the full screen up, you get this pop-up menu. So you just drag the cursor right down to the bottom within this little zone and you'll get these options up. You can minimize the virtual box. So you can see it's been minimized. Um, I can see that my own desktop, and I'll click it back. And there's various other, this is the view option where we put it into view, full screen and so on. Um, one thing I'll do is show you what I'll do when I shut this down. I'll close it by pressing that cross and I'll show, save the machine state. So what this will do, it will, sh it will save the environment as it is without me having to shut down the machine, which can be quite useful just for carrying on between sessions. And if I click OK there, you can see it's saving the current state of the VM. So that's the memory, the disk state, the processor state, and so on. And you can see it says saved there. It doesn't say it's powered off. So that is currently suspended, but it's also saved. Um, what we can do next is to do things uh, such as creating snapshots, which can be extremely useful, especially the kind of work that we're doing where we're um, building up something. If you do take snapshots regularly, then it gives you an option to return back to that moment in time without you having to do redo a lot of work. So for example, what I can do here is to take a snapshot by clicking this button here, give it a name. Um, for example, initial Gen2 boot. And I can put some more information here, for example, the display configured to full screen HD and keyboard configured to UK extended. So it gives me some information about what uh, or the progress of that snapshot. If I now click OK, it's recorded the state of the machine as it was then. So what it means now is if I start that by double clicking it, or I can click the, if I close this, I can click the, oh, all right, it's going to start it up. Let me shut it down again. It's actually popped up on the other screen for some reason. I start that there by pressing that button there. I don't know why it's starting on the other screen. Let me put it back to full screen. No, that's not it. View full screen. Not sure why that yeah, it keeps popping up over on the other screen now. Let's find out why that is. Right, this didn't happen when I was testing this. Let's try that again. Right, okay, it's back on this screen. Uh, it may be that I had one of the other windows selected when I was going off screen. Um, right, so what I was going to show here, let's let's start that again. I save this again. Right, so I've taken a snapshot, it says initial boot, and if I click the properties, it will show me the description I've put with it as well. What this means is that if I now start this machine up again, yes, yeah, switch to this other screen for some reason. And say, for example, I do something catastrophically wrong 
and I'm going to do something here you shouldn't do but I'm going to um, delete everything within the root it's actually warning me that it's a dangerous thing to do so I'll put that command in to override it and I've now deleted the system if I try to run things you'll see there's no programs there at all I can't run anything um, LS doesn't work let's try Firefox doesn't work you can't find anything I've, I've basically trashed the system I've, I've destroyed it um, can't do anything in fact if I do control D there I can't even load up a um, console to work with if I type in console there's an option there to run it but nothing's happened there's an error down here saying it's failed so I've, I've completely trashed the system I can't do anything with it so if I quit this by taking the snapshot it means I can go back to that moment in time by right clicking on this and do restore I don't want to create a snapshot of the current machine state because it's it's in a state that's of no use to anybody so I'll, I'll untick that and click restore and what that's done is restored the state that I bookmarked if you like that I've taken a snapshot of and made it the current state so now if I restart this Right, this keeps on appearing on the other screen for some reason. I'm back to where I was. So if I now start, click that there, I've got a console up. If I type in Firefox, you can see it's loading. So that's why the snapshot can be quite useful and why the VM can be a really good tool within um, when, when developing or building Linux from scratch, uh, especially if you're uh, do it for the first time, you're a bit unsure about, about what you're doing. 